Uh, it's at this uh, time, it's my great joy to introduce one of my colleagues uh, here in the faculty, Serene Jones, who will introduce uh, Professor Moltmann. Uh, Serene is the Titus Street Professor of Theology. She is an ordained pastor in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. She is a highly regarded scholar with many, many publications to her name. But most of all, Serene, we call you a friend of the center, and we're delighted to have you here and welcome you to the podium to introduce Professor Moltmann. Thank you. Welcome, Serene Jones, please. It's a pleasure to be here today and to welcome all of you to Yale University Divinity School. What an exciting conference to be a part of, one which not only explores the interface between the academic and seminary study of theology and the wide world of work, culture, and the popular imagination, but also a conference which stands at the place where theology meets the church and the world meets God. It's an honor to have been asked this morning to introduce the speaker, a man for who over half a century has stood at the place of this interface and spoken to us in a voice at once erudite and grounded. Jürgen Moltmann, Professor Emeritus at the University of Tübingen in Germany, is widely acknowledged both around the world and right here in New Haven as the preeminent Christian theologian writing today. Through writings such as The Theology of Hope, The Crucified God, The Coming of God, The Source of Life, God for a Secular Society, Experiences in Theology, and his newest book, The End in the Beginning, In the End of the Beginning, he brings to us a vision of the world in which God passionately and unrelentingly cares for a world broken and suffering and yet called to hope and possibility. He gives us visions of a faith that is as broadly ecumenical as it is eminently practical. A faith that is as politically engaged as it is pastorally compassionate. A faith that is full of as much sobering reality as it is with extravagant expectations of a world to come. I think about him as a theologian in three ways. He is, at one level, a theologian's theologian. He writes texts that rigorously push academic theologians like myself to think in creative new ways about our inherited traditions. In this role, he has given us not only theological minds like our beloved Miroslav Volf here at YDS, but has given us two of North America's leading feminist theologians. Nancy Bedford, and Joy McDougall. But at another level, he is also theologian, not just for theologians, but for the church. He gives us a theology that dares to speak right smack out of the experience of faith, a theology that dares to believe and calls the church to live up to its beliefs. But even more than being a theologian's theologian and a church theologian, Jürgen Moltmann is a theologian for the world. He takes us on a journey into the heart of God who exists first and foremost for the sake of the whole world, that groaning creation that unfolds around us. He speaks of a God who holds the life of an Iraqi fighter as tenderly as she holds the dying words of an Iowa farmer. Trust, what a thing to be thinking about together. Yes, finally, our trust is in God and perhaps God's amazing trust in us. And if it is God's mysterious trust in us that is part of this conversation, then for my part, what better witness than the theology of Jürgen Moltmann a man who again and again I trust to speak truth 
and to give life. May I present to you this morning's speaker who will tell us why Lenin got it wrong. It's not about trusting in power, but about the power of trust. Control is good, but trust is better. Jürgen Moltmann. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad that I finally made it to this place. <laughs> and thank you very much for your beautiful words, Serene. Uh, I don't believe everything you said about me, but uh, it was nice to listen to your beautiful words. Uh, well, my topic is control is good, trust is better on freedom and security in a free world. Or to put it in a simple term, on trust and truth. Well, <clears throat> trust is good, control is better. This was a famous saying of Lenin. And in the sad old days of the Soviet Union, everyone was able to marvel over the socialist police state already at its very frontier, having finally, after prolonged efforts, acquired a visa and after presenting a multiplicity of documents, one had to show one's passport not just to one official, but as a rule to four. The first official checked whether the visa was correct and the passport still valid and properly stamped. The second official checked that the first one had checked correctly and the third checked the second and the fourth finally had to check the third, the second and the first officials. Lenin's precept ruled supreme, trust is good, but control is better. But every thinking person was bound to ask, what does this all lead to? And where does it stop? A hundred years earlier, Karl Marx had already perceived this dilemma of the police state and was forced to raise the unanswerable question, who controls the controllers? The Soviet Union's answer was, controllers control the controllers. <laughs> and as a result, in the Soviet Union and the East European socialist countries, the state security authorities, the GPU and KGB, secret police, etc., expanded to an untold extent. Like a cancer, the sterile, life-destroying cells of an all-monitoring state security and its informers spread into every town, every village, every factory, into schools, universities, even into every family, and disseminated not security, but general and total mistrust. Never say what you think, for the person who hears you could be a spy and informer in the pay of the state security authorities. So stop forming your own judgment and say only what you are supposed to say. Never speak the truth, but only what they want to hear from you. And what got lost in this process was not, was not just confidence in the government, but self-confidence as well. After the unification of Germany in 1989, we got to know the archives of the East German state security authorities which were made available to everyone. The information collected there is overwhelming. It reaches from political remarks overheard in the street down to the pillow talks of lovers. Spoken and written words were put on record. Telephones were debt, tapped, letters copied, movements and bank accounts docketed, and so on. The Stasi, this is, was a name for the state security authorities in the socialist police states, were often compared to an octopus, a moloch, a cancerous growth. For the financial expenditure required for these unproductive activities was enormous and continued to grow. After the controllers have to control the controllers, the budget for the Secret Service already expands immeasurably 
before a controller had, has controlled a single person in the population as a whole. Why? <clears throat> it's simple. Because no controller can be trusted. Nowhere corruption is as widespread as in the secret police and the state security authorities uh, in, the, in Russia, even today. Now, every escalating state security authority leads inescapably to the security state. That means total surveillance state, in other words, the police state, the dictatorship, the Leviathan. When any such state is bound to self-destruction because of two insoluble problems. First, security becomes increasingly expensive the more officials and controllers the security authority has to employ in order to feel secure. And second, in a state of this kind, no one tells the truth. Everyone says only what his or her authorities want to hear in this case, the party and the government. Production figures were falsified so that progress could be reported. In the end, the government no longer knows what and whom it is really governing and lives from fantasy figures, as we saw it in East Germany in the old DDR. It will be true to say that the Soviet Union and the socialist states in East Europe destroyed themselves through these two factors. First, through the phantom of the total control of the people and the control of their controllers. And second, through the lies about the true conditions demanded by the government. The conclusion to be drawn from this experiment, which failed so bitterly, is that the question of trust in politics is the question of truth. Controls spread mistrust, and mistrust turns tr truth into lies. But the lie is a power which destroys life. Having become a little wiser from the experience of sto state socialism, let us look more closely now at the connection between trust and truth. So my second point is, Control may be not so good, but trust is always better. Without trust, no control functions. But can the controllers be trusted? And the second question, without liberty, there is no need for security. So what security guarantees our liberty? Let us first ask, what is trust? And what do we mean by this word, trust? We have it on different levels, so the first level is if we look at trust psychologically, we shall follow Eric Erikson and arrive at the basic trust of the child, which grows out of its mother's loving commitment and care. Astonishingly enough, this basic trust endures even if the mother turns away or is absent from the child for a while. The child acquires a trust in life which is stronger than the fear of life and mistrust of what is strange. We might say that a capacity for trust develops which can even stand up to justifiable mistrust. Out of the trust which the parents, especially the mother, gives it, the child develops a slow but sure self-trust or self-confidence. And this self-trust makes it possible to come to terms later in life with disappointments and betrayal which we experience if our trust is misused by other people. The next level is if we look at trust ecologically, we understand that trust is an atmosphere for living without which there can be no human life. Human life cannot be lived just like animal life. It must be affirmed, accepted, and loved. For the very reason that human life can also be denied and rejected and despised and hated. A human life which is denied, rejected, and despised becomes sick, as we know, and in some instances dies. This is not only true of children who have been made street children or child soldiers. 
It applies to adults too. Trust is a necessary habitat of freedom. It's living space. Where other people trust me, I can develop freely and go outside of myself. Where I, met, I'm, I meet with mistrust and rejection, I'm forced into a corner and withdraw into myself. So we may say fish need water to swim and birds need air in which to fly and we human beings need trust in order to develop our humanity. Trust is the element in which human life exists. A trusted environment, I feel free. I encounter a strange environment always with mistrust first or certain suspicion. The next level, if we look at trust sociologically, we discover that the foundation of all stable relationships is promise. Nietzsche once maintained that the free human being is the being that can promise. Unfortunately, he forgot about the second part of this truth, but every child would add and must also keep his or her promises. If I keep my promises, I make myself reliable and trustworthy for other people. Through the promises I give, I pin myself down in my original ambiguity and become unequivocal for other people and for myself as well. In faithfulness to our promises, we acquire continuity in time because we are reminded of ourselves when we are reminded of our promise. So free people acquire identity in their promises. People who break their promises lose at the end themselves. Those who keep their promises remain true to themselves. If we keep our promises as far as we can, we create trust. If we break our promises without good reason, then we are rightly mistrusted. The person who takes no account of what he has promised becomes a cheat and in the end no longer knows himself or herself. This identity in our life history is designated by our name. Through my name I identify myself with a person I was in the past and anticipate myself as a person I am going to be in the future. With my name, I can be addressed. With my name, I put my signature to my contracts and guarantee my obligations. The shared life of free men and women in a society is always a dense web of promises and re reliabilities. In this social warp and weft of mutual relationships, trust acquires its familiar face. The next level, <coughs> since social reliability are the basis of every free society, the result is a social consensus or what used to be called in Rousseau's phrase le contrat social, the social contract. In every society, even in the most pluralistic and highly complex societies we know today, there are fundamental agreements and understandings basic laws, constitutions, values, and unquestioned, unquestioned matters, of course. The person who breaks or ignores them must reckon with sanctions. They represent the basis of trust for the social dealings of men and women. It is not so much a matter of eternal laws which are enforced under an appeal to a divine and therefore unquestionable authority. This is more a covenant made by free members of society with each other and with the coming generations and not least, as I hope, with the earth too. This covenant is subject to the principle of pacta sunt servanda, agreements must be kept. Those who infringe the covenanted constitution of society excommunicate themselves. Social trust is withdrawn from them. And finally, in the level of the political sector, this fundamental covenant is 
in our modern states the Constitution, in which civil rights are laid down so that they can be appealed and claimed before the courts if they are infringed or withdrawn. The laws of the state must be in accord with the country's constitution, written or unwritten, as my English translator uh, said to me. If they do not, they are invalid. The constitutional rights of the people can only be set aside in emergencies if general security requires it, and even then only for an agreed limited time. Now, in a country's constitution, civil rights are formulated in accordance with human rights, which are generally recognized. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 and the International Covenants on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights of 1966, as well as the Earth Charter of the United Nations of 1992, provide the internally an internationally recognized basis of trust for the countries in the community of the United Nations. They are the unifying bond of this growing worldwide community of nations. So the country which departs from it because it trusts only in its own power is isolated. It loses its trustworthiness among the other nations and peoples. It can spread fear and terror but cannot win trust. Now, having looked at the different dimensions of trust, we now come to the question of how one wins trust, creates trust, and restores trust. Whether in private or in public life, the answer is quite simple. It is, speak the truth and you will be trusted. For we remember that the boy who falsely called wolf, wolf, was not believed when the wolf actually arrived. And if you put instead of wolf terror, you know what I mean. Only truthfulness wins, creates, and restores trust. The rule is clear enough. Gustav Heinemann, a former German, West German president, formulated it for his political colleagues as follows. Say what you mean to do, and do what you say. Don't think that the people who voted for you are stupider than yourself. They can stand the truth, even the bitter truth, better than the smooth lies or political evasions. But curiously enough, <clears throat> it is politicians especially, of course I'm only talking about German politicians, which I know <laughs> personally, <clears throat> uh, who often have an impaired relationship to truth. Does politics ruin the character, as some people say? It is probably not so much a, a matter of the character of the people concerned as the attitude which sees politics as a struggle for power. In a struggle of this kind, speeches are tested not for their truth, but for their effectiveness. They are then used for propaganda or to deceive opponents or enemies. We experienced this especially drastically in times of war. In war, truth is always the first victim. In order to invent causes for war, lies are spread and truths are repressed. And I remember the beginning of World War II in Germany with a faked assault of Polish troops on a radio in Gleiwitz, but these were SS in Polish uniforms. So during a war, then, truth cannot be spoken because it could be of use to the enemy and would unsettle one's own people. Because in war, people <coughs> always have to stand behind its government. The government no longer needs to try so hard to win the people's trust. It's easy to rule with emergency powers and martial law, but not in freedom, and not with trust either. How can trust then be restored once it has been misused? I believe through the honest admission of the lie and the plea for forgiveness. That is to say, a request for new trust. If I tell the truth about my lie, or my breach of trust, 
it is painful for me. I become vulnerable for reproaches and attacks. But it is indeed the first step into the light of truth. And only the truth will make me free. Whether or not others forgive the person who acknowledges his lie or continually hold it against him, he is superior to them because he stands in the truth and has regained his self-respect. He has taken over responsibility for himself or herself, and that sets him or her far above all their accusers. One can indeed trust someone who tells the truth about his mistakes much more than someone who claims never to have made any mistake at all. The trust that is restored or reborn through confession of guilt and forgiveness is a strong trust because it has gone through broken trust and mistrust and is now trust that has become wise and which is able to stand up to opposition and contradictions. Children have an innate, innocent, basic trust. Adults have to find and learn a mature, realistic trust. Blind trust must become clear-eyed trust. Okay, with this we turn now over to a theology of trust. And I begin with the famous slogan, in this country, in God we trust. On every dollar note we read, in God we trust. I will leave on one side the familiar and ordinary and very cheap critical comments and ask instead, what has the name of God to do with a bank note? If goods are no longer exchanged directly, potatoes for milk and milk for potatoes, etc., but if notes are issued by banks instead, this is preeminently a matter of trust, of course. That's why banks give themselves names like Trust Bank in order to appeal to the trust of the investors. Anyone who puts his or her money in a bank does so trusting in its probity. Anyone to whom the bank lends money has to prove his or her credi creditworthiness. But what has credit to do with a creed. I suppose that in the early period of monetary transactions, there were few ways of checking clients so that the re their reliability was deduced from their religious ties. If they trust in God and are good God-fearing people, they can be trusted with one's money. Can one believe or trust in someone who doesn't believe in anything? No. That's why the banking trans transactions were overarched by the heaven of confidence in God, in God we trust. But what God is it in whom we place the trust of our heart and rely upon, and whose promises, uh, who promises us security or confidence in life? Let us listen to Martin Luther's interpretation of the first commandment in his large catechism because it seems to be the most modern interpretation of faith in God. Following medieval tra tradition, Luther puts the Bible's first and second commandment together. And now I quote, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. That is, you shall regard me alone as your God. What does this mean and how is it to be understood? What is it to have a God? What is God? Luther's answer, a God is that to which we look for all good and in which we find refuge in every time of need. To have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe him with our whole heart. The trust and faith of our heart alone make both God and an idol. If your faith and trust is right, then your God is a true God. On the other hand, if your trust is false and wrong, then you have not the true God. For these two belong together, faith and God. 
that to which your heart clings and entrusts itself is really your God. Now, this mutual relationship between faith and God is so modern that it could derive from Feuerbach or Nietzsche as well. And in fact, for his projection theory, Feuerbach actually referred to this passage of, in Luther's large catechism. Luther, of course, meant that the faith of the heart makes the eternal God present within us. Feuerbach, on the other hand, made the divine the invention or wishful thinking of the human heart so that all gods were idols and human products. But Luther and Feuerbach agree on their criticism of capitalism saying that money is the most evil idol to which human beings can subject themselves. The idol's name is Mammon. So Luther goes on in his large catechism saying, many a people think that he has God and everything he needs when he has money and property. In them he trusts, and of them he boasts so stubbornly and securely that he cares for no one. Surely such a man also has a god, Mammon by name, that is money and possessions on which he fixes his whole heart. This is a most common idol on earth. And this was a statement of the 16th century. Many critics of the modern world in the 19th or 20th century have followed Luther's demonization of money. In his Ode to Joy, Schiller writes, and money reigns the god of earth. In his philosophy of money, Georg Simmel called money the god of our time. The system theorist Niklas Luhmann maintained that in bourgeois society, the omnipotence of god is replaced by the omnipotence of money. Money is the all-determining reality. And today, anti-capitalist programs are often called anti-mammon programs. God or money, that seems to be the decisive question of faith. But is it really? But then how can we distinguish the true God from the false ones, according to Luther? By relating both the true God and the idols to the trust of the heart, Luther makes this the anthropological criterion for the distinction that to which your heart clings and entrusts itself is really your God. So if your faith and trust is right, then your God is the true God. To have a God means to have something in which the heart trusts completely. So the little word completely, so, or wholeness of the heart, offers the criterion for distinguishing God's, God from the idols, the true God from the false gods. The Shema Yisrael already stresses the totality. You shall love God, the, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The one eternal God can only be loved entirely, or he is not loved at all. If we love God only half-heartedly with a divided mind or only from time to time with a little bit of faith, we fall short of God. For the one God is the creator of all finite things. We can easily make the counter check. Can I really love things that are earthly and created, transitory and destructible so totally that I place the whole trust of my heart in them, be it money or health perhaps, or my country or football. No, that is impossible. It demands too much of them and leads inescapably to disappointments. And it destroys the finite vulner vulnerable beauty of created things if I take uh, to be absolute what is relative and expect of these fragile things what only God can give. Only a love of God that has gone wrong, miscarried and failed deifies what is human and absolutizes what is worldly.
thus destroying it. Ecclesiastes already says that he who loves money will never be satisfied with money. Because a person knows in, the heart, in his heart of hearts that money is not God, he becomes addicted. And addiction is always a sign of idolatry. The trust of the heart in God who holds everything in his hands frees us from idolatry in the world of human beings and lets created things be seen as they are in their finite and transitory beauty. Then money ceases to be a mammon and becomes a benefit in dealing with the goods of this world. Our whole heart and our whole confidence belongs only to God. We can then deal sensibly and wisely with everything else in the way suited to their nature. And Jesus gave a good advice. Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous mammon. Luke verse, uh, chapter 16. The value of money, as we know, changes, but friendship endures. Now, the question, can we trust God, the transcendent God? The true God is a God who bears. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote in his book on discipleship. And this changes our perspectives. We are so much used to a God who rules and reigns from above at will. And we don't know the will of God. We believe sometimes in the sovereignty of the absolute freedom of God. A closer look into the biblical witnesses show, however, that the God of Israel and the God of Jesus is at the same time and much more a bearing, an enduring, a suffering God. His rule is not one of command, but of patience. His omnipotence is more his all-enduring strength. Look into Israel's Exodus story, repeated in the first commandment. On the one hand, it was Yahweh's power liberating his enslaved people, destroying Pharaoh's army. But then on the other hand, it was God's bearing power. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought unto myself, we read in the book of Exodus 19. And what was the image for this bearing God? First, it was a feminine image, carrying them in thy bosom as a mother bearest the, the sucking child unto the land which you sweared unto their fathers. So we read in Numbers 11. But there's also a masculine image for it. We have it in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And in the wilderness, where you have seen how the Lord your God bear you as a man does bear his son, in all the way you went until you came to this place. The true revelation of this bearing, enduring, and suffering God is a suffering Christ on the cross, bearing our sicknesses, bearing the sins of the world, bearing our griefs and our sorrows, and by this upholding all things by the word of his power. So God's creative power is his enduring power, giving the creatures time and space and new possibilities to life and to develop themselves. And I believe that we can rely upon this true God like resting on a fundament. To use a word of Greek philosophy, God is a hypokaimenon, the trusting ground of everything. And the image, I think, is not so much the untouchable sovereign in a throne on heaven, but much more Atlas carrying the globe on his strong shoulders. And on this God we can rely as we rely on a fundament or a ground. Now we turn to the next point <coughs> of a theology of trust. It's not only that we trust in God, that 
in us gods God trusts. Trust is always a mutual affair, and this is true of the trust in God too. We trust in God, God trusts in us. This is the heart of biblical stories and messages. God trusts us, God believes in us, God hopes for us, and God expects us. People who understand this become God's trusted and familiar friends in his creation. Gloria Dei est vivens homo, said the church father Irenaeus, the living human being, that's God's glory. If we are to be God's glory and blessing in the world, then trust in God is a foundation for a firm self-trust and self-confidence and challenges us to look with confidence into the future of the world. There are two forms and ways of trust which can be differentiated at this point. First, as we have said, there is trust which arises itself in a familiar environment, a trusted environment, as we say. I know my father's house, my home, my friends, my country. In my neighborhood, I am known and valued. So trust is for me a matter of course, a matter of familiarity. Vertrautheit in German. But there is also trust in God which made Abraham and Sarah ready to leave their country and their friends and their father's house and all their familiar surroundings and to wander like as strangers through strange lands in order to follow the star of God's promise. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing, and by you all the families on, of the earth shall be blessed. This was a promise, and therefore they left. This trust in God's promise for the future is what the New Testament calls faith. It is a confidence about things we hope for, and a lack of doubt about what we don't yet see, as we read in Hebrew 11, and as a whole 11th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews tells the biblical stories from Noe to Jesus are stories about this confidence in the future, confidence in the promising God. And it puts men and women at odds with their familiar and trusted environment and makes them ready to let go of the old and look for the new thing which God has promised. It does not familiarize them with their environment it alienates them from it, but this makes them capable for the future and makes them free. There is no freedom without a certain amount of alienation from your environment. Here we discover a qualitative difference in the concept of trust. On the one, in the one case, our trust is linked with familiarity, so with safekeeping in what is familiar in the preservation of what one has and knows. This trust in the familiar and accustomed binds the present to the past and is conservative through and through. In the second case, trust is bound up with confidence in German Zuversicht. It has to do with setting forth out of what is familiar and known. It is about alienation and freedom about openness for the unknown future and faith in the promising God. Here, trust has a future as its lodestone and is a power which can face up creatively to the challenges of the future and with joy in experiments. Here, trust in God means the courage for risk. The God who, as the biblical stories tell, calls men and women to take the path towards his promised future, evidently trusts his word to the inconstant people we are. He challenges us to accept his covenant. He hopes for us. He expects us along his way. And therefore, God has so much patience with the world. He promises to go with us and bear us where we start out and seek his future. Also, the history of humanity is a history of injustice and violence, unbelief and godlessness, etc., etc. God still believes in us 
and holds fast to his trust in us. I think this is the inexhaustible source of new courage, new beginning, and reborn hope which doesn't give itself up. In biblical faith, trust in God doesn't mean safekeeping, security, as if we were still in our mother's womb. It means freedom in the wide space of the coming God. Now, my last point is on restoring trust, creating trust. He asked, can trust be restored once it has been misused? Let us look finally at the possibility, first on the personal level and second on the political one. For our analysis, we shall draw on the distinction we have just made between trust that comes from familiarity and hope for the future, which means confidence, zuversicht. Well, on the personal level, if trust in a relationship or an atmosphere for living is destroyed through lies, personal lies, public lies, unreliability and unfaithfulness, the people who trusted are hurt, and the ones who have destroyed the trust lose their credibility and to some extent their identity. The atmosphere is poisoned. The old trust cannot be maintained. But can new trust be created in such a situation? I think our Christian tradition has a sacrament for this, the sacrament of penance, which can also be called the sacrament of liberation. This offers us three steps which can be of help. First, confess your ores, the confession, the admission of guilt, spoken out, confess your ores, the step of the person into truth. Second, Contritio cordis, the contrition of the heart, turning away from guilt and turn to righteousness, the change of mind. And the third, the satisfactio operum, making good of the harm done as far as this is possible. This is new community. So the confession of truth, the change of the heart, and uh, this uh, try to make good what has done wrong. These three steps are preceded, accompanied and followed by the forgiveness of guilt, the assurance of new trust and the offer of new community. So it does not matter which step we take first. Repentance without forgiveness is a sterile torment. Forgiveness without new community leads nowhere. Forgiveness can only be given in the power of the assurance that a new community is possible. With this prospect, which is opened up for the guilty, the pro process of repentance or liberation can begin, and it becomes a joy in new life. Repentance has nothing to do with self-destruction and depression and uh, all these nasty things we normally combined with the term repentance. If you look into the chapter 15 of the Gospel of Luke, you see repentance is joy. There's great joy of God, in God and in the one who repents. Forgiveness of guilt is not a backward-looking act only. It op opens up new future. The person who experiences it can let go of the past for forgiveness of guilt is a down payment of trust made in hope. Now, on the political and public level, it seems to be more difficult, but I think it's not. On the political level, enmity can be dispersed through confidence-building measures, vertrauensbildende Maßnahmen, as a terrible German word is. Through trust in an alternative future of peace and cooperation, Trust can indeed replace mistrust. For this, uh, we have certain models. First, in the middle of the Cold War, in a divided Europe between an Eastern Bloc and the West, from 1973 to 75, 
the Helsinki Conferences on Security and Cooperation in Europe were held in this divided uh, place. Here, so-called confidence-building measures were agreed upon, which perforated the Iron Curtain, because they dispersed the mutual uh, ideological mistrust. The propagandists, deepening the divisions, gave way to cooperation for the purpose of new community. Today's integration of the European community is a result of sustained effort to build up mutual trust, and this goes back uh, to some extent to the Helsinki conferences on security and cooperation during the Cold War and the divided world. The second point, I'm hesitant to speak about it, but I think I should do it. Uh, I was not, never very happy with German politics in general. I was normally on the side of the opposition. But by and large, the German post-war policy of reconciliation, first with France, later with Russia, or the, at that time the Soviet Union, and most recently with Poland, has borne good fruit. This po policy began in post-war Germany, first with the Nuremberg trials, which brought a certain amount of justice into a country of injustice and violence, and also with the Stuttgart Confession of Guilt in uh, summer 1945, made by the German Protestant churches. And second, most secretly behind German post-war politics, is Auschwitz as a reminder or a symbol of the German change of heart. Auschwitz became the primordial spiritual story of post-war Germany, so that we sometimes speak about a post-Auschwitz Germany. And in the center of Berlin, you don't have monuments for the unknown soldier anymore, but the monument reminding of Auschwitz. And then with reparation payments to the victims of German crimes against humanity and with a strict peace politics uh, today. What comes to my mind are two more uh, models, <clears throat> uh, the peaceful transitions from Stalinist dictatorships to social democracies in the East European countries. Uh, they show similar processes of repentance and liberations. Uh, they have undramatically initiated in order to arrive at the truths which alone can guarantee freedom, the realization of what went wrong and who did wrong, and the change of heart and the reparation to the victims of the rule of violence. And you have the same uh, reflection in the famous truth commissions in South Africa, organizing the rebirth of freedom in an exemplary fashion as perpetrators and victims are brought together into the light of truth. Now this brings me to a following conclusion. The restoration of trust is possible not only on the personal level but also politically. Every step to truth leads to new freedom and new trust. And at the end I'm reminded of Hebrew 10 verse 35. It's right when it says, do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Moltmann. For those of you familiar with Professor Moltmann, what a joy. For those of you not familiar, you see now why we are so delighted to have him join us. We've just heard not just catchy, memorable phrases like who will control the controllers and my favorite, an impaired relationship to truth, but we've heard about the life cycle of trust, if you will, the life cycle of trust, its formation, its imposters, its brokenness, and hope for its restoration. And we've heard a theological interpretation of trust, God's bearing, God's enduring, God's suffering through Christ on the cross for us. In God we trust, and shockingly, in us, God trusts, leaving us with an inexhaustible source of a new beginning, a new hope, a new source for trust. Dr. Moltman has graciously agreed to take a few questions, and if I could ask the questioners to please ask questions and not make statements in the interest of time, we'd be most appreciative. And Heather has a, thank you, Dr. Moltman, Heather has a mic. Uh, who would be our first question? Serene, please. Yes. Shall I just ask Yes, since you're so close, please. Thank you so much for that lecture. Um, although your, your primary context for reflecting on trust and political life and faith was Germany, um, as you occasionally hinted at in your lecture, in our context, it, it must be our present political and cultural scene. And one of the things that is, I find most surprising in this present moment, particularly looking at all of the discussion we've had around um, um, the, whether or not there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and the lies around Enron, a, a number of very um, public discussions of lies, the degree to which it seems the American people don't want to trust the truth. You have an anthropology that seems to suggest mm -hmm. we inherently want the truth and will trust it. What happens when you live in a world in which you see again and again the truth is not where people want to put their trust. This, this sort of very complex relationship to it. Well, you certainly don't want a German to make statements about American politics because you know America better than I do, so it's your task, not mine. Uh, in Germany, we have a saying, Lügen haben kurze Beine. Lies have short legs. So uh, you, cannot lie, you cannot endure uh, lying all the time, uh, while with truth you can endure. Uh, there's a certain unsymmetrical uh, picture between truth and lie. Uh, a lie is a distorted truth, and you cannot uh, live with this for a long time. It's uh, destroying yourself. Uh, destroying the environment and uh, therefore it collapses at one time. Uh, so I don't believe that we can live for a long time with, with lies. Uh, truth is everlasting, as is said in this respect. Um, of course, there are people who want to cheat other people with lies. Uh, there are also situations in which we wish something very definitely, and therefore we are looking for arguments, very cheap arguments, which can uh, fulfill our wish. And uh, this may have happened to uh, Tony Blair, for example, uh, and others. But I must remind you, with the beginning of the Iraq war, there were the United Nations uh, investigators with Hans Blick who uh, investigated already every corner of uh, the Iraq and couldn't find means of mass destruction. <clears throat> so uh, I think uh, it would have been better to uh, cling to what you really know and uh, say this is what I know and this is what I have doubts, have doubts about it than to say in 45 minutes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they are ready. Uh, 
how could he know that it's not 35 minutes or 55 minutes, but exactly 45 minutes? So uh, uh, I think they brought themselves into, into difficulties which they have then to work through afterwards in, again to get, to get trust. And this is only one example. Uh, we, we have had this in our country uh, with Konrad Adenauer and others who uh, made similar mistakes, I believe. So say in public, say the truth and you will get trust. If you don't say the truth, you will create mistrust. And mistrust is as uh, dangerous as uh, the dangers of terrorists or so. Okay, let me stop at that point. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, the woman. Oh, sorry, go ahead. My question is if you have more insight on the process of reconciliation. Uh, I was in Eastern Europe and well, I remember being in Hungary right after the, um, all the names were named about who had uh, been spies for the government and so forth, and was in East Germany when the Stasi report came out. It's easy to say that that, that truth then is the gateway to reconciliation. I don't think we've had many of those ex kinds of experiences in this country. And how do we trust that process of reconciliation? And do you have any, I mean, what is the ongoing process that happened? Well, I think that there can be no reconciliation without stepping into the light of truth, even if it's painful. Uh, you cannot say, well, let's forget about the past uh, and all the crimes uh, committed in uh, the socialist government in Hungary, for example, and start something new. Uh, no, it doesn't work because the old gangs are still there <laughs> and the old uh, uh, connections of the people are still there and all of a sudden you have uh, um, communists uh, who uh, turn out to be liberals. They change their mind very quickly without saying, well, we d uh, this was wrong what we did. I think uh, the first step into truth is uh, to confess the truth. Uh, but um, a lot of people feel that that is depressive and uh, that I could not, they could not stand it, etc. So uh, one should open the arms to, to that, um, as the Truth Commission in uh, uh, South Africa did. So come and speak out and uh, that's the first step to reconciliation. At least this was what we experienced publicly in, uh, in uh, Germany, in West Germany, after the war. Uh, it was very difficult for many people, my father for example, to accept uh, public and collective guilt. Uh, and that we did wrong defending our fatherland and giving Hitler one uh, year after another to, to continue his crimes. But it, but it was, to some extent, liberating, I think. Uh, for finding out about the truth, you should not first of all ask the perpetrators, but the victims to tell their stories, because the memory of victims is a long memory, always. The memory of perpetrators and evildoers is always very short. And therefore, for them to find out about the truth of themselves, they should, must listen to what the victims tell them. And then all of a sudden, they, the blind eyes will be opened and they see. Uh, this may be a rule if we start first listening or telling uh, the stories of suffering uh, to each other then we become a feeling for the other part and, have, and can give up our self-defense protection. Uh, I think in the Balkan at the moment there are groups working with this method. Let the Serbs and the Croats and the Bosniaks come together. Uh, 
the best place would be the graves of the victims and then let one and the other tell their story of suffering under the other and then they will find and see the truth but it's a it's a it's a long process and we, it needs a long of uh, uh, much patience but if we are reminded how patient god is with us we should be patient at least to some extent also and one last question then we'll have to wrap up peter Um, in any environment, like a corporate environment or a public environment, what are the first steps that lead to an abuse of trust? What is it about an environment or about the people within that environment that starts on the slope downwards and ends up in abuse of trust? Well, I'm not a person in this world of corporations and uh, economy, as you know, uh, according to my experience, is uh, to keep things in secret. Uh, then you uh, change the trust uh, you had enjoyed so far into suspicion. People have, he's not, he's not telling the truth, he is not lying, but uh, there is something going on in secret, and then suspicion arises. So uh, uh, be, be frankly as much as you can. Uh, there may be things which should be kept in secret for a while, but then you must say to people, well, I cannot talk about this or that, because we must keep this in secret for a moment. But uh, it will, there will come a time, and then I will tell you, then you keep the trust. So, so always Tell the people what you're going to do, and then do what you say. Thank you.